So yeah, Kieran and Liam, thank you ever so much for coming and joining us today. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about what we're going to be doing today. Cool. Hi there all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, if you haven't said who you are and where you're from in the chat, I know a couple of people have just joined. If you wouldn't mind doing that, um, I think Liam's going to get some slides up um, and do a screen share. So I'm Kieran. I, me, Liam, and someone called Rich started up Rad HR about a year and a half ago. Um, my background was for a long time working in the voluntary sector, largely in homelessness and youth offending at first for larger charities and increasingly for smaller, more grassroots ones, becoming very interested in more co-productive, more values led, more non-hierarchical ways of working, which seemed to me to have a benefit, but were also really challenging to do and really feeling like it was knowledge needed to be shared between different organisations as to how to do these things differently and how to do them well. Um, so long story short, when Leah mentioned the idea of starting up initially, we were thinking it would just be a website where people could share their alternative policies and processes and their more values led way of working. I was really excited. Um, and over the past one and a half years, Rad HR has grown from like a little side project kind of website to something something slightly bigger now. Um, Liam. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think, yeah, my my own route into some of this stuff has come a little bit more through kind of radical activist sort of spaces um, and groups that are really committed to values that often often aren't found as much in more formal and hierarchical kinds of organizations and workplaces um, but through the sort of experience and practice of groups realizing how tricky it is to actually practice those things and start and trying to put together um, to varying degrees of success like what does it mean to organize ourselves in a more collective and democratic way what does it mean to make decisions in ways where like everybody actually has a voice and is able to contribute meaningfully um, and uh, and then also working in more sort of com community based spaces, community organizing kind of settings as well. Um, and Kieran and I, I guess, yeah, have have been having conversations related to this stuff for probably probably coming up on a decade now, I think. Um, uh, and so, yeah, like Kieran and Rich were de are de definitely two of the people. Like as as a three, we have have come to a lot of the same questions from quite different perspectives. Uh, and Rad HR has kind of been a space that we've been trying to create to help a, a range of groups, whether it's small, small sort of community facing groups, whether it's larger, uh, like uh, whether it's more activist uh, groups that are coming with a more clearly political approach, um, like making space where group, groups that are exploring what it means to organize according to our values can can find and share the learning around that as much as possible so i think a, a phrase we use a lot is learning different ways of being radical from each other because you know within small voluntary sector organizations there'll be a really different understandings and knowledge about what it means to be values led from some activist groups and we think sharing that learning and building on each other's understandings is is potentially a good way forward um so we've got a bit of an agenda for today, which Liam? Yeah, um, the, yeah, just a bit of an out outline for what we were, what we're planning for today. Um, we've slightly shifted the icebreaker idea and want to just get a little bit of a sense from everybody about some of the questions that brought you, brought you into this, uh, brought you to the session today. Uh, then we're going to do a little bit uh, around what's wrong with standard HR and like highlighting some of the problems that I'm sure all of you have experienced at times before, whether whether it's because you've had it imposed on you or whether it's because you um, struggled to find versions that, that feel aligned with your values. Uh, then we'll do a little bit more of an intro to Rad HR, the website itself, just a quick walkthrough of the things that you can do on the site and um, the thing, yeah, what it means, what what it means to to join the Rad HR community and take part in that in different ways. Then we'll have a short break, 
Uh, and then we sort of picked a couple of uh, policies from the RADHR library that have been uploaded by members of the community uh, that are relatively brief ones, but that highlight some, some notably different approaches to how we write internal policy to internal policy and process. And there'll be a little bit of a chance for sort of paired discussions to look at each of those. Um, and then a little bit of a feedback, a little bit of feedback from that before before wrap up. So that's that's a bit of what we're we're planning for today. Um, um, I think we're a little bit ahead on time. So do we want to do a quick kind of icebreaker? Just maybe people putting in the chat um, what brought you here today. I reckon we're a small enough group that if anybody feels oh, yeah. to turn turn their mic mic on and uh, yeah. and jump in and say hello as well then that, that would be that yeah. would be managed either in the chat doable. either in the chat or say out loud whichever whichever you prefer i'm happy to jump in and i have to apologize i thought i was muted because i've been sat here munching on my sandwich so apologies no for that <laughs> I thought, yeah, I thought I'd come along today. Um, Amelia works in my team. I'm just really, really um, excited by this session. I think um, certainly at Voluntary Norfolk, we're doing a lot of work to try and push forward our HR practice. And it's, it's, it's can be quite challenging. So I think I'm just really keen to sort of look at some different approaches. And I think particularly sort of working in the community sector where we, we are values led or try to be values led. I think it's really important to staff as a way of engaging staff. Um, just keen to understand how we can do that better, I guess. Brilliant, thank you. Anyone else? Cool. Um, I'm happy to go next. Hiya. Um, I'm Jess from Your Own Place. I think I was really interested by today because five months ago I moved into the COO role at Your Own Place. So kind of exploring yeah, my thoughts and role within HR. Um, I'm really interested in co-producing stuff with the team. And yeah, we strive to be a values-led organisation. So I'm intrigued to hear more about today. Brilliant, thank you. Anyone else have? Liz. Liz yeah. yeah, um I just um Home Start Norfolk have seen um, and still going through lots and lots of changes, um mostly funding related. Um, but as as teams grow, wane, things change, um people's situation changes. Um I think it's really important as a small organization um to understand how how HR is so important for cohesion of a team and bringing that team together and we don't have the capacity to have independent you know our own HR department um, and so I think you know um, my situation is any any information I can get around good HR practice but but HR practice moving forward you know, it's it's about looking at, at how HR has moved on and what it means now to people as well. And to be able to deliver that to the team is really important to me. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Anyone else? I know a lot of people have their cameras off, so they might not, not be actively participating. Anyone else have anything they want to share? Otherwise, we can, we can move on. Cool. So... The, the next thing we wanted to do was just maybe just for a minute um, kind of reflect reflect on your own on what you think the problems with standard HR policies and approaches and standard yeah, HR processes might be within community sector organisations or small voluntary sector organisations. Um, and then we can have a little bit of a discussion about that. So maybe just, just a minute to reflect on that. Cool. How are we all doing on that? Ready to have a bit of a chat? Brilliant. So has anyone got any thoughts about what they think the problems with standard HR approaches might be within community organisations? I'll do my best to try and capture people's feedback in, um, in the slides, which will be shareable afterwards as well. 
Um, I just popped down treating people as a procedure rather than as a human being. Ah, that's really interesting. Have you got like any examples in mind of that? Or... I just think for every policy, there's exceptions. And so, so how, yeah, how do you have a human approach that follows a that alongside a policy rather than it being a rigid procedure that's meant to fit every circumstance and human being that's involved within it? Oh, that's really interesting. Thanks. Um, anyone else have any thoughts about the problems of standard HR approaches within values-led organisations? I've got one reflection, but I don't know. Is that all right? Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually just reflecting on the experience of um, um, someone I know who was working for a small, very kind of cool mental health music charity, you know, working with all sorts of young people, um, ostensibly very, you know, on it organization, but in fact, she called out a certain degree of corruption and nepotism within the organization. And there was really nowhere for her to turn she turned to one trustee who's like yeah you can tell me you can trust me but he I can't remember I can't remember but he didn't follow through or he talked to the CEO and eventually it, it, it ended up on the arts council kind of emergency list um and um I think that the CEO was forced out but there was really nowhere for her to turn she actually ended up turning to um the musicians union I think um and even the union rep was not, I was just struck by how much she was on her own with it. Um, and in these very small organizations, you know, there may not be any HR, you might be able to outsource your payroll. But, but in my own experience working in, in small voluntary sector organizations, it, it's not even easy, that easy to turn to trustees, because it's not necessarily, it's like whose remit is it in a very small organization? Um, uh, you know, aside from the kind of where's and where, why's and wherefores of contracts and so on. So I just, I'm just throwing that in as, as a, a difficulty when in a, a much larger organization, even a larger voluntary sector organization, hopefully there is some line management, some neutral direction that you can take any, for want of a better word, concerns, grievances, you know, which isn't necessarily that easy when the very maybe just like two or three employees, for instance. So that's just a reflection. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a really interesting one. Yeah. Like not like within a small organization, like where do you go with that, right? And not having any kind of procedures or processes or real accountability around, around that stuff. Um, yeah, that's really interesting, thank you. Um, has anyone else got any thoughts? Just wanted to say we've had to lose somebody because they've got they've got a migraine and they were feeling okay. they couldn't quite cope. But I think we've got we've also had someone join as well. So yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I think it is. It's Lucy. It's, it's what the perception of HR is to everybody as well, and I think that's that's what um, I find is a real challenge. You know, um, what what does HR mean to different people? Um, and I think in a small organisation where we don't have anyone to necessarily turn to, that concept of what, you know, so people would say HR. And I think that means so many different things to so many different people in a small organisation like ours. That's very difficult to manage as a challenge. Hey, that's really interesting. Do you mean like people don't have a kind of shared conception of what you mean by when you talk about HR? within the I, team I, I think so because it can be as you go you know if you've got those members of the team who know someone who works for a you know a corporate body or something like that you know um it's it's like Jess was saying earlier you know there is that, that um the scope is so huge in under the umbrella of HR trying to fit that huge scope into our little organization and so that staff feel confident comfortable you know um like alice to say know who to turn to um that's quite a challenge yeah that's really interesting like people feeling a like they know what 
HR is all about and then knowing what the particular policies and processes are that they need to use in particular circumstances and then how to use them. Yeah. Um, and then give the staff the confidence to understand that as well. I think that's, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Amelia, did you have your hand up? And I think Lucy, you did as well a second ago, did you? Do you, do you want to go ahead, Lucy? Yeah, I mean, I, it's I, I really agree with all the points that have been made so far. I think, I think, but I think also the voluntary sector is quite diverse. So I think, but I think there is a common issue around just having the resources to be able to resource HR and it being a, a huge function, even for the larger organisations. And I think it's also, I think sometimes because there's so much kind of legal requirement, it can be quite disempowering. And you kind of think, oh, well, I'm not an expert on that. And it, it's quite, and it can just sort of stop things from moving forward. And I also think a lot of the sort of um, need to be more inclusive and sort of manage EDI effectively often sits with an HR function. And that's another whole big area of specialism, which again, I think is just quite difficult for small organizations and large organizations to sort of navigate. So I think it just feels like there's an awful lot that sits within HR and it, that can just in itself be quite overwhelming. That's really interesting because, yeah, it's a huge kind of spectrum of things that HR includes, right? Um, and then people feeling like they have, yeah, the knowledge or the expertise to be able to engage in that at all is really tricky. Uh, thank you. Has anyone else got anything they would like to share? Any thoughts? There's quite an interesting sort of conversation going on in the chat um, or sort of an exchange um between sort of Nicola and 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 Tab, about, oh, miss about, that. so um, about the term human resources seeming quite outdated. And I don't know if Nicola, if you wanted to talk on this because you sort of talk a little bit about the history of it, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, yeah, Nicola, if you'd be up for for sharing a little bit. Come on, come on. Um, okay, so I'm a HR professional, um, but basically, okay. I mean, if you go back to the 90s, you've got uh, David Ulrich's academic um, perspective that became very much part of the cultural norm for organisations in managing their people, that people were a resource, like money. So there's that perspective that has obviously um, been leading quite strongly for 30 something years. Um, and I think, you know, the move is probably more about people and more about um, culture now. And I think that's where the, the reflective part of practice comes into this um, and psychological safety in the workplace, et cetera. So, you know, um, there's been a shift culturally, certainly with uh, what's happened in the past three years, that people have become more able to say how they feel about things in the workplace as well. Okay. That's a really interesting thing to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just reading Richard in the chat. My background is a large corporation where we had well-documented policies and procedures which enabled managers to be compliant with both employment law and good practice. So Richard, I mean, you can, you can put your response in the chat if you don't, don't want to turn your mic or camera on. So are you kind of saying that your experience is that within a large corporation, HR processes function quite quite smoothly. Yeah, so at any time they could pick up the phone and get advice, which I guess is really different in small voluntary sector organisations, right? There's no one really to pick up the phone to and get advice or yeah, mm. or feel like you're able to do that. Um, should we? So do, do you did you want to say something, Liam? Oh, yeah, I mean, I guess I was just going to say that um, it, and there's a lot of variables in any organization that will shape how, what HR turns out like in practice, what, 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 it, what it actually looks like and feels like for the people involved. Um, and there's an element which I, is a bit of a, a pattern I'm hearing from a lot, of, a lot of folks here today, which is around just the absence of anything uh, or the like the impenetrability, like the complexity of trying to get your head around any of this stuff, just even as a baseline. Um, and like, I think there's a sort of an almost like parallel piece that I think 
just got out at the start of like the treating people as procedures rather than human beings, not being able to make room for the exceptions, that kind of thing. Um, and so there's sort of like these, it feels like two parallel problems almost. There's the total absence of having any kind of support for people that, that would relate to policies and processes, procedures, that kind of thing. And then there's having procedures that are also, that, that don't treat people very well as well. Um, and I guess like, yeah, the, the, um, I think this is one of the like the, the tricky situations that that sort of is the, leads it, that sort of is tied to one of the things we built Rad HR around, which is that when you're stuck with it without anything on that kind of, among around that kind of support, it's easiest to just sort of take whatever all, off the shelf options can be found, and then that can land you in a bit more of a tricky position because like often those off the shelf versions haven't thought about like, as um, was just said a minute ago, like equality, diversity kinds of questions are often um, thought about, either not thought about at all or thought about in quite rigid ways that don't recognize the, the realities that people might be facing, you know? Uh, so I guess just wanted to highlight those patterns of like total absence and then the ones that just don't seem to be working full stop for people's, to meet people's needs. Lucy, did you have your hand up a second ago? No. Oh, sorry. Okay. Right. Um, cool. Cool. Should we move? We've so we've got a couple of slides, kind of identifying some of the key issues we we've identified with standard HR policies and procedures. So maybe go through those quickly, and then maybe have a little break, and then come back and look. Oh wait, look look at the Rad HR website, then have a little break. Um, cool. So as Liam said, you know often you know in small organizations you don't have the capacity to be writing all your hr policies from scratch so you get them off the acath website right um and those off the shelf policies tend to be written within and for a corporate context which often is not very relevant to community organizations and not profit values um either the off the shelf versions or ones potentially made within organizations often tend to be made by people with specific HR and employment law, law knowledge, often without the input of the wider staff team um, and without the knowledge that the wider staff team could give them as to how things actually kind of work in practice. And as someone mentioned, I think earlier on, they're often really inaccessible to most people because they're written in like very specific terminology that doesn't really makes sense to most people unless unless you have a specific understanding of that um you know often potentially in larger institutions like i think somebody mentioned the issue of human resources as a term in itself um which views people as yeah as as resources rather than as complex human beings. And the whole nature of HR in itself is about protecting the interests of the institution, not necessarily the people within it. Um, again, not something that really is helpful within a values-driven voluntary sector organization. Um, often because they're made in a context very different to the voluntary sector, some of their framings can embed wider social power imbalances, such as racism, classism, and ableism. And yeah, often again, because they're made in a more corporate context, they tend to replicate broader social and political assumptions about power, knowledge, and value. Things like who gets paid and how much, whose work is valued, what work is valued, who makes decisions, how we think about care, how we handle conflict. Often standard HR policies can be quite punitive. They can judge payment based on values that are not really relevant to how we see things within the voluntary sector. Decision, they can embed quite top-down ways of making decisions rather than more inclusive ones, which is how we might want to do things in the voluntary sector. They rarely think about centering care, which is often, you know, a very core value within the voluntary sector. Um, and yeah, for all these reasons, it feels important to 
try and think about how to do HR differently. Um, Liam, did you have anything to kind of add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess just maybe a couple little practical ones. I mean, one of the ones that catch, gets me all the time is like standard grievance and disciplinary policies, like which is one of these things that legally every organization that employs people has to have. And how rarely there's a significant distinction built into those between somebody who's struggling to do their job because maybe it's because of a disability, maybe it's because they're going through a difficult period of life or mental health stuff and people who have caused harm to one another in an organization like often it will you'll end up looking at the same bit of policy to address both of those things if you haven't put a lot of effort into thinking about something quite actively different and so being able like like the ableism of that is the most explicit thing that comes to mind uh for me when like you you have have somebody who's struggling with a workplace that is not accessible being treated as though they are failing to meet their standards uh and then that that moves into often grievance or just like it moves into disciplinary procedures and that kind of thing so like there's these sorts of things that are just like really baseline standards if you if you cat if you take a lot of a lot of standard acas or like um like various law firms templates uh policies where it's really explicit that like if there isn't a specific law that's actively protecting something, and you could argue that like different parts of equality law would make that what I was just describing harder, and that's true, but that still so many default processes still do have this like day to day reinforcement of a lot of bigger problems that we uh, we like in the voluntary sector we would not want to recreate things like that, um, but it it takes quite an active pushing against the pushing against the, the, the the current a lot of the time in order to make that happen um i think a key thing a key kind of reason behind setting up rad hr is we'd each had experience of different organizations and groups trying to do a few of their own policies a bit differently and you know with some success but you know it takes ages to rewrite your whole you know suite of hr policies and what small organization has time or capacity or headspace to do that um hence the idea of maybe thinking about how we can share some of those alternative policies together um yeah. just looking at time liam should we go yeah go on to looking at yeah. the site yeah so just to give a bit more of a sense of what rad hr is um it's a website as kieran started by saying at the beginning the core of the website is really a policy library that's created by users. I'm going to stop sharing the slides for a second, then move over to sharing actual RAD HR. Um, just give me one second to make sure I'm bringing the right things up. Um, so yeah, the core of, um, can, can everybody see the, the website now? Cool, just making sure it had switched over properly. Um, Core of Rad HR is the policy library. It's created by people who use the site. Um, it's policies that have come from small voluntary sector organizations, community groups, activist organizations, uh, mutual aid networks, cooperatives, arts organizations, that kind of thing. Uh, so going through the policy library, you have a uh access to a whole bunch of things if you look down the left hand column of the screen you can look at a whole range of tags from accountability care leave for others codes of conduct complaints conflicts data protection there's a whole range of tags we have and this is like for the this is this has only been live for a few months now so like it's growing day by day um but all of the policies that are in here have at least something about them that is uh equity focused justice focused about trying to shift shift the kinds of wider power dynamics that might easily be perpetuated in the wider wider world um and if you look at the policies themselves uh that are listed here you can sort of see the organization that they've come from if the organization put its name information about is it a co-op is it a community group self-managed or flat structure or if there's a if there's a hierarchy there um, so we have a pretty wide range uh, of different types of groups that are 
that have already been contributing to the site. Uh, and it's a range of things you can search by along the left. It's not just those, those tags of, of what type of policy it is. Um, but we'll also have things like, yeah, the type of organization, the type of structure that it has, how many staff, uh, how, like what size it is, what its turnover might be, how long the policy has been used for. So there's a range of ways you can really hone in on what it is you're looking for. Um, and if you look at one of them, for example, um, let's take a look at, um, socially just way. We're going to take a look at this one in a little bit afterwards. So I figured I'd start with that. This is what each of the policies look like when you bring them up. There's a summary at the top that sort of captures, um, what what this policy is trying to do what makes it different from a lot of standard like in this case this is this is an alternative to pay policy standard pay policies um uh, recognizes different different staff members needs and backgrounds um aims to provide financial security and reflect the organization's ethics and principles and tends to uh tries to address the fact that pay tends to ignore people's pre-existing circumstances and treats people time as worthy of different amounts uh so it sort of moves away from a lot of like meritocracy and like just purely tenure based based uh wage differentials um and if you look scroll down on the left hand side here you have a bit more detail of the summary of like who the organization is that's created it what size they are all those things that you can search in the previous thing you can download a pdf of it here uh, you can join a discussion of it, which we'll come back to in a minute in the community side of it. Um, but then the policy itself with all the headings linked from the top. So it could be the kind of thing that if you're working on a pay policy and you have most of it ready, but you want to look at one particular element, like which could be about inherited wealth and does inherited wealth shift how, how people's uh, income looks or um, does like different a, a more radical approach to length of service? It may be that you just want to look at that one particular section, and then you can go and copy and paste some bits from this and adapt it for your own organization's uh, setting, your own organization's context. Um, so, so that's a basic introduction to the library. Uh, we also have guides, which we've been thus far mostly working with an organization called People Support Co-op, who do HR support for cooperatives primarily, uh, and they've helped us write guides on pay policies, holiday policies, grievance and disciplinary, sickness, um, safeguarding from another organization, so we'll look at that right now. But each of these aim to give a bit of an outline of some of the kinds of questions that will come up if you're starting to draft a version of this policy yourself for the first time. Um, what does the law say around it? Um, what are the kinds of ethical questions you're likely to come come up against if you're if you're do, trying to create this policy yourself for the first time? Like it, it can be in some situations that you're going to come up against bits of the law that really don't mesh with your values. Um, like the there are ways in which uh, equity based pay, for example, compared to equality based pay, like may may be may mean having to like think about how you fit within the law if you're recognizing different people's circumstances, which may be actually like not not fit within equality law. And so like there's times where there's choices to say, like and what we try and do with these guides is give people a bit of a bit more space to make conscious and deliberate decisions when they're thinking about um how uh, how they're how they're developing their own internal policies and processes. So there's some thought that's going into like, are we just doing this because it's what a template told us to do? Are we doing this because it's what the law said? Do we think there's any room to push what the law says on this to make it more aligned with our values? And so these guides are really a way to try and uh, bring those those questions to light when uh, you're in the process of, of trying to create your own. Um, then that we've also got a blog section, uh, which is a, a series series of blogs by members of the Rad HR community talking about different parts of their um, their experience and their journeys of working on uh, trying to create more 
um, more anti-oppressive or more collectively collectively based internal policies and processes, as well as updates from things that we're working on. Um, so this is something that we're we're always looking for new people uh, within the Rad HR community who might have narratives that they want to share. Uh, we realize that uh, that policies can only ever tell you so much about the stories that created them. That that a policy itself is maybe a really important document to have created, but often the work that's gone into that policy, often the sort of the thinking of who's been involved, what were the challenges, what what did we think would work in a certain way, but we discovered didn't actually uh, like had unforeseen consequences we hadn't imagined. Uh, when we actually tried to put it into practice. And so we really want like to make sure people in the community are able to share stories like that. Uh, and that ties into the the last main piece, which is the Rad HR community, which is a community discussion forum um, where people can discuss any of the policies that are in the library uh, or any of the blogs. Uh, people can ask questions and make requests for particular kinds of policies if they haven't seen them in there or are wondering if anyone else has like had any experience in using particular policy approaches in practice and can feed that back. Um, and so there's a range of discussions that different people are involved in uh, that that range from, yeah, uh, uh, managing conflict and learning from it, um, being able to be have open and transparent in the way that you work without sort of putting too many of people's personal details out there, which can feel like exposing or shaming to them. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer feedback and reflection processes if you don't have a system of top, of like top-down line management. So people are talking about all of these kinds of things and feeding back to each other, um, yeah, different ways and approaches of doing that kind of thing. So, um, this is something any of you can sign up for. It's um, quick and easy to sign up. Um, and it means that you can contribute and be a part of any of those conversations if you're in a position where you're like, we never thought about having to have a parental leave policy because there was three of us and nobody had, and we hadn't done that before. So we're going to ask the, the Rad HR community if anyone else has tried to do that in a, in a way that's aligned with their values, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, and since the end of November when we launched, there's about 150 people already in this community and the discussions are starting to become more active. So that's sort of a bit of an intro to what um, what Rad HR is about. Um, Kieran, did you want to add anything to, to that? Um, no, I think that's good. Um, just to say that it's radhr.org is a website, just in case um, <laughs> we, ha we haven't said that. Um, Useful bit of info. <laughs> Um, yeah, it'd be really great if any of you were interested in kind of signing up and kind of using the site. Um, do you just want to show the policy upload page? Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry. So if um, if you're uh, once you once you've become a member of it, anyone can add a policy, um, and it sort of gives you a bit of context. There's a video talking through like what kind of information we ask for, and what like one of the things we realized early on in this process was most people aren't used to sharing internal policies and so people get stuck in a like is this within our own policies to share like who would we ask who needs to approve this uh and so we've done our best to sort of put together a bit of effort like frequently asked questions and a video that sort of uh involves or just talking through like what the what the information uh that we're looking for is and why we ask for it uh but you can like fill in the name of the policy a bit of a summary about what it tries to do uh, the actual text of the policy or upload a a PDF or a Word doc or anything like that if you if that's easier. Um, all the tags, lots of different types of tags you can add to it to make sure that it's findable by other people who are looking for the right things. Um, uh, a few other tags of like, is this free to implement, which will obviously be a big, big variable for some groups like it's easier to make some kinds of policies radical if you have enough bu budget to sort of pay people better or offer more generous terms on certain things. But we know that's not always going to be an option. Um, we want to make sure people know, like, can say if they're looking for, if they, uh, if something's been uh, made GDPR compliant and thought about privacy in that kind of way. Uh, if there's something that, that about gender neutrality or trans inclusiveness that, that 
uh, can be really big in distinguishing some policies from each other. Um, and if time, and this is totally an optional thing, uh, but it always helps when people are uploading policies if they can put any reflections on how it's worked in practice. Uh, so if there's any opportunity to just say, like, oh yeah, we our first draft of the policy included this clause, and then we realized that nobody was taking advantage of it because nobody really understood it, but then we had to rewrite it in a way that would like recognize some of people's circumstances a little bit more, something like that. So it can save other people going through the same types of uh, having the same hang-ups or challenges arise when they're trying to implement their own version of it. So, um, yeah, but that's like we depending on how how much you choose to write in that section. Like you can often upload a policy in about twenty minutes or so, um, and then there's some information about like how it makes its Creative Commons. I don't know if everyone's familiar with Creative Commons, but it's basically a, an alternative to copyright as an approach to intellectual property and it's just basically saying we acknowledge and share want to share this and we want everyone to have the ability to take and adapt what we've uploaded here and to turn it into something of their own um, which is what the basis of the site is kind of built on and then you can click uh, submit and then with a little bit of tweaking behind the scenes from us then your policy appears in the RAD HR library um, so yeah uh, any other Kieran, have I missed anything else um, there? Yeah, no, no, just one thing to add on that is often people say, oh, I don't know if my policy is good enough to add there because, you know, it's not perfect. It's maybe not radical in these ways. And, you know, none of us have perfect policies, like far from it. We're all just trying to do something different and we'll make loads of mistakes along the way. Um, so if you have policies that you think are a bit different that you'd like to share, please do, you know. And part of it is about learning from each other's policies, building on each other's policies, improving each other's policies. So definitely don't feel like, oh, my policy isn't, you know, alternative in all these ways. So I can't I can't share it. It's just about all of us doing the best we can and learning from each other as much as possible. Absolutely. Cool. We're a little bit behind on time. Um, so we're going to have a 10 minute break now. I wonder if we might be able to, to to squeeze it down a little bit, set maybe like seven minutes or so. Just give us a little bit, a little bit more time for discussion when we come back, if that feels okay to people. Does that feel all right to everyone? Or maybe okay, come back. Just just before three, so I make it sort of ten two now. So mm -hmm. three yeah, let's... to three. <laughs> Three minutes, three minutes. Three to three. minutes to three on the dots. <laughs> I was just going to say, I know some people were taking notes, so we'll circulate the links when we send out a follow up email. So, and anything else that Liam and Kieran want us to send out as well. So, we will share that afterwards. Yeah, and we'll share the slides as well, which have a lot of the information. Yeah. And when we come back, we'll do a little bit of a group group uh, activity looking at a couple of the policies that are in the library. So, okay. hopefully, see Brilliant. you all in seven minutes. See you in seven minutes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Bye.